Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it is an uh, absolute delight to, uh, to be with you, Ariana. And uh, I thought I should uh, introduce you to our audience here. You know, Ariana and I met about three years ago uh, over lunch uh, at uh, the Clinton Global Initiative. From that first meeting, we found that we had uh, a lot of common interests, uh, a lot of uh, uh, deep interests. I, I immediately respected what she was doing um, and the things she was passionate about. Building a place online that would empower people and give them a voice to share their everyday issues. Uh, actually, before I dive completely into it, I should, I should point out that um, you know, Ariane is a, an accomplished uh, and experienced public speaker. And speaking publicly myself uh, is not something that I enjoy doing terribly well <laughs> much. And, and I forgot last night to actually tell you that there's a little secret that, uh, that I forgot to activate when I came on stage here. When you are about to speak publicly, I don't know if you do this, I was taught the first thing you should do is look at the exits. <laughs> and what that does is it, it adjusts your fight or flight response. <laughs> and, and it gives you basically, there's a way out. So if all of these people start to attack you. So anyway, so I'm sorry, I meant to mention that right at the, right at the start. So, uh, Ariana also has, um, I think, a very important view on what she calls uh, post-partisanship. And it's really trying to get beyond the left and the right to get to the core issues that really matter to everyday people. Uh, um, instead of blindly following a party I ideology, we need to find out what really matters to human beings and, and work on those issues. Uh, so I really, I really appreciate that. Um, over the years, we've uh, we forged a friendship based on uh, our uh, mutual belief in uh, responsible journalism, connecting people through technology, and empowering individuals to create positive change in the world and in their own lives. Ariana is a true digital pioneer. Uh, she launched the Pulitzer Prize winning Huffington Post website eight years ago. And today there are editions for many different countries, including France, Spain, the United Kingdom, Canada, Ger uh, Germany, Italy. And she has partnered with the leading media companies in each of these countries. It could be Le Monde in France, Asahi in Japan, uh, El Pais in Spain, Grupo Espresso in Italy, Berta in Germany. Uh, and as um, these traditional media companies start to think about how to move online, Huffington Post's global audience is, is tremendous. She has built an audience that attracts more than 75 million unique readers every month. And to put that in perspective, I mean, that's tremendous. <laughs> to, to put that in perspective, that's uh, about 20 million more a month than the New York Times, as far as, as far as we can tell. So the New York Times may be a global brand, but Huffington Post uh, is even more of a global brand. And um, despite all of this work, as far as I can tell, uh, Ariana has the fastest response time <laughs> on email of anyone I've ever met. I, was, I once clocked her at 27 seconds. Uh, this puts me to shame, to great shame, and, and uh, remarkably always insightful and thoughtful comment. It's, it's truly tremendous. As if heading a media empire isn't time consuming enough, uh, Ariana is also a nationally syndicated columnist and an author of 13 books, a regular television commentator for American networks like CNN, NBC, PBS, ABC, and Bloomberg, among others. So Ariana, I hope uh, you feel at home here today. We have many people from around the world. You yourself uh, have uh, lived and worked around the world. Um, so welcome. Thank you for Thank joining Thank you us. so much. It's so great to be here. Uh, let me start by asking, how many of you have an accent? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I now feel completely at home. I don't need to look for the exits anymore. <laughs> Ariana, you know, as you know, um, we cover a range of topics here at the Executive Forum. Uh, and today's session is, uh, is about uh, creating, is about the media's role in creating social change. I know that 
I know that you take this seriously at the Huffington Post. Uh, and so to get us started, I wanted to ask you to really speak about media in general and how you think about, does media have an obligation to create social change? First of all, let me just say that um, I have been a very big admirer of what you and Pam have been doing. And uh, one of the things I love most is that you're interested in the whole gamut of things that I'm interested in, and you're actually uh, engaged in that whole gamut, you know, from politics and holding our politicians accountable and improving public life, all the way to the other end of spirituality and how do we become ourselves more conscious human beings in everything we do. So that the fact that we can cover uh, this whole array of topics and that you are doing so at this conference is incredibly important to me because so often these things are compartmentalized. And uh, that's why I think part of the compart compartmentalization about media has been that media has been seen just as um, the observer and the reporter. And it was as though if we also were engaged in having a positive social impact, we would become cheerleaders for a particular cause or other and partisan. And I see it very differently. I think that uh, putting the spotlight on what is working is a huge obligation of, um, the, in, in what the media need to be doing. And I don't think we're doing a very good job at that. So I have tried at the Huffington Post to create dedicated sections that deal specifically with what is positive, with what is happening around the world um, that is actually advancing social change and having a positive social impact, because then we can help scale the good things happening. Exactly. Um, I love what you've said for many years now about the fact that people are inherently good. And, and um, we need to do everything we can to encourage these better angels of our nature yes. because there are all these other elements that compete for attention. Yes. So at Half Post, we, we launched, for example, a good news section right. that only deals with good news. And it has 5 million UVs a month. So it's not true to say that only if it yeah. bleeds, it leads, you know, the conventional way of approaching news. Right. And, um, and then we've launched um, a section called What is Working? That is specifically about what is working around job creation. Because there's a lot that's happening around job creation, for example, um, that isn't getting enough attention. You know, there may be somebody starting a little business with two employees, but if we can help them scale, they can hire more people. So the, the reason behind doing all that is to help good things that are happening scale. Right. I think, I, I think that's, that's tremendous. And, and um, I mean, you mentioned, I think, that one of the first questions that people ask uh, about some of these sections about good news or, or impact. I mean, of course, you know, that's, that's, our, that's my favorite uh, section, uh, uh, really focusing on what, are, what is having impact in the world. The first question people ask is, you know, how can you afford to do that? Um, you know, aren't there trade-offs? Because, of course, most of the traffic goes somewhere else. So how will you continue to highlight some of these good news areas when most visitors are going to sort of the other traffic that is much less, uh, much less beneficial, let's say, for... for well, site. here's what is so interesting, and I think that has to do with the zeitgeist. I really believe that there is such a thing as a zeitgeist. I hope we had a better, less uh, Germanic and difficult sounding word. Um, <laughs> but there is such a thing. And I think the zeitgeist now encourages these things. Let me give you an example. At the two conventions, I wanted to do something different. So at both conventions, we did the same thing. We created a, a, an exhibition for startups about a hundred startup entrepreneurs at each convention. This, this is the political, the, the yes, party the political, conventions for sorry, the presidential election. For the political conventions right, right. in, in mm -hmm. Charlotte and in um, Tampa, Florida. And, um, and then we had a panel moderated by Tom Brocco with um, a lot of people um, commenting on how do we actually encourage civil society to get involved in job creation. So given that the government is not doing very much, given that the job crisis is very real, and we still have a lot of people graduating from college who can't get a job, 
what can the private sector, what can civil society, what can non-profits do? Mm -hmm. And we created this whole thing because we really believed in it. We didn't think there would be any financial benefit. Mm -hmm. But then Goldman Sachs called us and said, we have a $500 million program where we help support small businesses around the world, including 10,000 women entrepreneurs around the world. Mm -hmm. And he said, but we, nobody kind of knows about it. So we'd like to sponsor a dedicated section on the Huffington Post mm -hmm. called What is Working, which uh, tells the stories of all those thousands of small business people around the world that they have supported. And, and we tell their stories in video, in um, text, uh, slideshows, and most important, we let them tell their own stories. Right. Now, that was a seven-figure deal. Now, that was not at all why we, we did what we did at the convention. Probably would not have happened five years ago. Right. But right now, you see every major brand, every major global brand is, is spending more and more around their causes. They want to be identified with a cause. I mean, you have Coca-Cola that wants to be identified with wellness, for heaven's sake. You know, there is, <laughs> <laughs> there is something happening if you mm -hmm. look around. I mean, three years ago, actually, for us, the first uh, brand that became a sponsor was Johnson & Johnson. Their cause is global maternal health. So they sponsored a section called Global Motherhood, where we track this issue. We have people benefiting and people helping around the world, telling their stories again. And every year, they just renew it. So while we are thinking of monetization being in terms of CPMs and banner right. headlines, right. things are changing. Right. Right. And this is a, a, a much more substantial monetization avenue. Uh, you know, I think um, I, that's really what I love about what you've done with Huffington Post. You really you started by challenging the conventional wisdom uh, about what would sell. And you really follow your own, your own values, your own uh, beliefs about what's important to talk about, uh, and you know, uh, and it and it sounds like uh, uh, the success, the, the 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 financial success has come after that, and it's just it's always it's 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 always wonderful to see people pursue their own positive human values and then be rewarded by the marketplace in in doing so. So I, I think that's that's tremendous. You know, in this. In this audience, there are many uh, nonprofits uh, and, 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 and for-profit organizations that really struggle and are very deeply interested in um, getting their own message out. So the question I have, I have for you is, how do you know, you know, or what makes a message attractive to readers? What is it that really um, uh, 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 attracts this interest? You've become an expert in, in understanding that. Uh, online, so I'm sure people are dying to hear this. I really think that the most important thing is authenticity and making it as personal as you can. People want to know why did you start your business or why did you start your nonprofit? What was your personal passion and motivation? And, and, and the detail that you love to read in a novel, you know, what were your circumstances? What was your family life? You know, what were the challenges? Mm -hmm. And the more personal you make it, the more people will identify with what you're doing and want to read it and want to share it, which is part of what we want. We want people to pass it on. You know, that great media sage, Will I Am, said, we used to consume news sitting on the couch, <clears throat> and now we consume news galloping on a horse. You know, we take it in, we pass it on. So <clears throat> that's what makes it shareable. And um, I must also say right away, that we would love to be a platform for all the amazing work you are doing here and, and to make it really easy for you. For me, <clears throat> you know, the, the Huffington Post is a hybrid. You know, it's a journalistic enterprise that has, you know, 850 journalists, reporters, engineers around the world um, that we're very happy to see win a Pulitzer, but we're also a platform. And I must say that still that's the one thing that excites me even more because we can give a voice to people who otherwise might not have a voice or amplify the voice they have. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, have your own sites, your own blogs. So it will be no extra work 
for you to cross post what you're already doing on the Huffington Post. And for us, it's not about exclusivity at all. That's the one thing I don't care about at all. It's about distribution. And it's about giving to our readers interesting content and giving to you um, another platform for your message. Right. So let me just give you my email address. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> because then you can bypass the Huffington Post bureaucracy and <clears throat> send it to me. We'll give you a password so you can post um, whenever you want. That's what we do with our trusted bloggers. They have their own password. And, uh, and then just have another avenue for distribution. So it's very simple. It's Ariana with one R and two Ns, at HuffingtonPost.com. What, what could be easier uh, uh, than a simple email to Ariana and your words will be in front of 75 million people. So it's pretty tremendous. Thank you. That's, it's really lovely. One of the things we've uh, talked a lot about, uh, uh, and one of the things that actually part of some of the people in this room work on is how polarized the public seems to have become, uh, in particular, in, in the United States. And um, this polarization, you know, m many people, or I should say some people, actually blame the media for in, uh, inciting and enhancing the polarization. So, um, you know, my question is, uh, sort of, what do, you, what do you see in this area? I mean, clearly, as I mentioned at the outset, one of your visions for Huffington Post by, by creating this platform of individual voices uh, and moving beyond partisanship, one of your goals has been to actually reverse this polarization. But what trends are you seeing in this area? Are we making progress? Is media, is media making things worse? Or is it getting better? What's, what's your view? So um, that's a very mixed picture. Because obviously, um, Partisanship, the level of partisanship is intense at the moment. And, um, and the media, the mainstream media are not helping. So I think what's happening as a result is a lot of young people especially are sort of opting out of politics. They want to be involved, they want to have an impact, but they are more likely to want to do it through nonprofits or civic work rather than political work, which is a real problem. And also many, many, good, smart, decent people who do anything in their lives rather than run for office. I mean, it's become yeah. so incredibly toxic mm -hmm. um, that you have to be pretty masochistic to, to want to run for office, Nedra. And that's also a big problem. Right. So I think that as a result, what we can do to create what you've called a new civic square um, in online media is incredibly important, more important than ever, because that's where the real work um, that's going to make the world better is happening. And, and a lot of that is happening from nonprofits. I know the Center for Public Integrity, Bill is here. I don't know where you are, Bill. Hi, Bill. I'm on the board of the Center for Public Integrity. You know, they've just done some amazing work on tax havens. Now, that's not a left-right thing. Right. That's why I love that work. You know, you don't, whether you're a liberal or a conservative, you should want people not to avoid paying their fair share of taxes through tax havens. So these are the issues that I think we need to be focusing more on, the issues that transcend ideology and partisanship. And there are many. You know, The jobs crisis is not a left-right issue. And we all want to have a thriving middle class in any country. Um, drone policy, continuing to be in Afghanistan beyond um, any clear reason why we're there. And there are people, conservatives and liberals, who agree on these issues. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to focus on. Right. Well, what, I, I mean, just as a, as a quick follow-up, why, uh, why do you think it is that despite often broad agreement across party lines on particular issues, you know, drone policy, you mentioned um, you know, background checks for for uh, yes. gun purchases is another you know, recent thing. Why is it despite that, despite broad agreement uh, across party lines on these among the public, why is it so difficult to get anything done in Washington? I think the, the main reason, unfortunately, is the, is the campaign finance mm -hmm. um, debacle now with Citizens United and with um, 
um, all the different groups fighting for the attention of elected officials and candidates. And, and you and I were talking last night about you know, the statistic that only a quarter of 1% donate um, anything more than $200. Yes, yes. So given that the uh, candidates are spending from 30 to 70% of their time fundraising, they're right. basically talking to one quarter of 1% uh, of, of the people. And that's right. why you're seeing food stamps being cut. Right and tax havens being allowed because, right. Right. you know, basically people who are on food stamps don't have the ear right. of the candidates and the elected officials and people who need a job don't have their ear. Right. So I think changing um, the way we, f we fund and uh, campaigns is going to be essential. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I was thinking hopefully the, the uh, members of Congress <laughs> spend, uh, you know, the rest of their the remaining uh, 50 to you know 30 percent time uh, reading the Huffington Post. So, uh, <laughs> maybe help them. I want to switch gears a little bit here um, uh, and ask you uh, about another topic before we move to uh, audience questions. You recently hosted a panel on uh, health, happiness, and well-being with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, and, uh, and with uh, Richie Davidson, who's a world-renowned um, neuroscientist. Uh, and the panel was called, uh, it, was, it was really lovely, it was called Change Your Mind, Change the World. So I wonder if you could tell us more about the work you're doing in this area, and I know you have a deep personal interest in this. Well, first of all, um, just thinking about the panel puts me in a very mindful, um, happy state. It was really amazing to be in, in, his, in uh, his Holiness's presence and also to have Mathieu Ricard yes, yes. on the panel who has been known as the happiest man on earth and, and you can see you know, how yes. incredibly present and loving he is. He really radiates that. And, and Richard Davidson is such an incredibly brilliant man. What, what I loved about that panel is that we're finally making the connections between science and spirituality. You know, our world has for so long separated the two um, as though they were um, actually um, completely contradicting each other when the truth is that uh, they are ultimately incredibly connected. And there's a book that I love um, by Arthur Kessler on, called Creation that has the stories of many great scientists and their spiritual experiences. So I think the fact that our world now is beginning to make these connections and that this holiness is so engaged in that and so supportive of that is very important because we see that a lot of these ideas are now going mainstream. Right. Uh, I was amazed, for example, in Davos this year to, to go to a few panels where Mark Williams, who is a professor of clinical psychology at Oxford, was teaching CEOs how to meditate. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now again, speaking of the zeitgeist, that would not have happened a year ago in Davos, <laughs> let alone uh, uh, five years ago. So there is a fundamental shift. Yes. And now there are 25% of American corporations that integrate some form of mindfulness training and stress reduction in what they're doing. Yes. So it's not just um, what you are doing here, it's what's happening in companies like General Mills and Aetna. And I'm personally very interested in that. We are in our business section, we have a couple of reporters dedicated to putting the spotlight on this because people are still amazed by the fact that, for example, the CEO of Aetna, Mark Bertorini, again, through a personal experience, which is how it often happens, he had a skiing accident, he broke his neck, he was hooked on narcotics for a year, and as he said, he was walking around like a zombie. He discovered meditation, acupuncture, yoga. It transformed his life. He then proceeded to make the benefit available to his 34,000 Aetna employees. And now, he, he said to me the other day, he said he, he doesn't want to leave his job as CEO of the third largest health insurance company in America until this benefit is available to all. Wonderful. So that's really what, um, what I'm trying to do is to spread the word, to make people realize that this is mainstream. This is not like new agey, flaky, right. California, right. Um, yes. you know, woo-woo stuff. Yes. 
<laughs> and, um, and that's why, in fact, we are doing this conference um, on June 6th in New York called Redefining Success, the third metric. Because I feel that if you go to the root of how we live our lives, our definition of success is a big problem. Mm. Because our definition of success right now is really almost entirely based on money and power. And even though we kind of know that's not what happiness and fulfillment really are based on, nevertheless, if you look at the decisions people make, they are so driven by these two metrics. So we want to talk about the third metric. And we de we're deliberately not giving it a name. Mm. Because we believe that the third metric consists of um, well-being, wisdom, being able to wonder, you know, a sense of wonder about life. Mm -hmm. And then to, to bring some form of service, of giving back into your life. You know, I like, I hesitate to use the term giving back because Pierre, I like what you said about <laughs> how it makes it seem as though when you're doing your real job, you are taking away right. and then you are giving back. And really what we want is to integrate yes. some form of impact, yes. of social impact in your life, in whatever, in whatever way, whether it is through your regular job or whether it's through your extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, again, I, I, I mean, I hope you, I hope, uh, I hope you all uh, who might not have known much about Ariana um, before this discussion now understand why, uh, why I have so much respect for her. Uh, taking the, the, the power of her distribution platform um, and, uh, and exposing these millions of people to these types of ideas to really help us understand uh, that, in fact, um, these aren't sort of crazy, uh, you know, California or, or, <laughs> or Hawaiian, or Hawaiian <laughs> I, I, ideas. They are ideas and, and practices that uh, we can all share just by virtue of our common humanity. Uh, I don't think there's another media executive in, in uh, the country, uh, if not the world, that is as deeply committed and focused on these issues as Ariana is. So I'm really delighted to, uh, that, that you um, uh, came here today, and I'm, 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 uh, I, re I rejoice in our, in our friendship and our relationship. So thank you so Me much. Me too. Thank, thank you so much, Joe.